I would like to thank AFSIA providing us the opportunity to present this information in the Signicor Regimental Association for donating the CIMA 4 flex. You see the uh, here that will be drawn after the session. So make sure you get a ticket for a chance to win <coughs> and one ticket per person. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Grüttner, German Exchange Officer, Branch of Lesson and Best Practices in the Cyber Center of Excellence. Our mission is to prepare soldiers to fight and win. By collecting and analyzing Army lessons learned, provide best practices and tactic, tactics, techniques, and procedures to the force to enable continuous improvement of signal, cyberspace, and electronic warfare. A lot of information has been shared during this event, TechNet Augusta 2018. The message on the handout read SEMA Integrated Delivery. From all the presentations that we were given and to the vendors showing off the latest of technology on how it can improve and modernize our equipment. There were a lot of presentations and discussions on SEMA and their perspectives on what the future holds. Cyber CUE Doctrine Division, Doctrine Branch presented current and upcoming doctrine supporting SEMA. Discussions on term being used throughout the Army cyberspace and SEMA emerged. Doctrine who always read gives us an insight on terminology and how our, <coughs> our forces are implementing the tools of today. Yet doctrine is a guide and it is the commander's prerogative on how he implements his forces to accomplish the mission. During this session, our message is, how can the army and industry help tactical signals officers to succeed? To my left, we have some subject mega experts that will provide an insight from their foxhole they have seen from our current operational units in reference to signal cyber and electronic warfare and of course SEMA as well. They will have about five minutes to present what they feel are the greatest challenges the tactical signal officer is experiencing and how possible, possibly it could be resolved from solutions at the army, institutional or industry new equipment, after which we will discuss such as why are some units successful in cyber defense of the network while others are not, what are the primary functions being performed by cyber protection teams, and what challenges, challenges exist, what are the systemic issues causing the greatest challenges to battalion and brigade as success. We will start with my boss, it's uh, Colonel Mulder, Doctrine Division Chief. All right, I'm just gonna stand up here so you can see me. Um, so I'm not one of the experts he was talking about. I'm just the egg timer to keep things under control. Um, so I will start off by introducing you to our panel. Uh, we have some great expert, true experts here from the National Training Center. Uh, from the uh, call Center for Army's Lessons Learned and from the CPB. Um, so to start with, the most important, uh, Chief Flanagan, down there, second uh, from the end. He's the EW Tech, or the EW Observer Controller Trainer from the National Training Center. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Norwood, uh, Senior Cyber Trainer at the National Training Center. Major Rick M Mears, Bronco 30. Uh, he's the BCT S6 Trainer. Major Don Sedevi, uh, Cyber Protection Brigade, one of the CPT leads for SEMA support to Corn Below, and Mr. Bruce Bruce Adams, Center for Army Lessons Learned. All right, so <clears throat> most of the time is going to be theirs. <clears throat> As I said, I'm just to make sure that they keep themselves under control, uh, but I'm going to give you three things that I am interested in. Uh, the first one is S6 challenges. Uh, I've talked to a number of people uh, throughout this conference. You know, 
I was a uh, observer controller trainer out at the NTC back in 1999. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so we just converted from horse cavalry, uh, and uh, we had some radios. And that was pretty much all the S6s had to worry about. A battalion S6, all they had were Sengars and uh, a, a retrans team. And that was their primary focus. And they were significantly challenged back then. Uh, the Brigade S6 pretty much had the same thing. Uh, had to worry about FM communications. And he had to make sure he had a plan to call up the signal battalion and ask them to deploy MSC to support their operations. I'm I'm simplifying it a little bit more than it should be, but that's about all they had to worry about. Since then, uh, we've piled a ton of computers uh, in every battalion. We've given uh, satellite communications, uh, IP networking, uh, servers, switches, you name it. And we really haven't given them a lot of help in, in uh, solving their problems. Uh, in fact, when we gave it to them, we gave them a bunch of people and since have whittled it down. Uh, to where if you go to a BCT and definitely a Division 6 today, they'll tell you they do not have the people to operate 24 hours, uh, that they're going to require significant augmentation. So we're not really doing them the justice for the amount of work that we've given them. So how do we make it easy for them? That's where we need industry's help and the rest of the Army's help to figure out how do we solve some of these challenges. Um, training in EW, I hear it all the time. Uh, we can't train EW at home station. What tools uh, do we need to help them not only train it at home station, but then what, is, what do we need to equip the, the uh, CTCs with so they can have a realistic training environment when they get out there? And then uh, finally on the cyber side, uh, I'm a cyber security guy, so units are significantly challenged in uh, accomplishing the cyber security mission. Uh, they're very challenged in reading logs and collating logs to enemy activity. Um, so how do we make that simpler for them uh, so they're not spending uh, the majority of their time trying to weed through for that golden nugget or that needle in the haystack? Uh, and finally, along this side of, of logs is uh, tools. Um, I just came from Southcom as the J6 uh, last year and while I was there, there were significant challenges in, in cybersecurity, and we needed to get some tools for it. So I went out to the community asking, what are the right tools that I need? And nobody could answer the question. So we did some napkin analysis and a leap of faith, spent $1.5 million of taxpayer money hoping that we bought the right tool. So what tools uh, can we get the biggest bang for your buck uh, and accomplish the mission. So with that, I'll turn it over to High Speed uh, Lieutenant Colonel Norwood and we'll start the panel. Can everybody hear me? So some of the NTC observations uh, as um, Colonel Malter just hit on is um, the overarching theme is people, process, and technology. Uh, observations at NTC when, uh, when the BCTs come, personnel is always a challenge, um, is what we see. Within um, the brigade's network environment, they do have uh, selected uh, computer network defense tools. However, the friction points are they don't have uh, personnel manning to man it 24-7. Um, and that poses a challenge to the brigade S6 as far as roles and responsibilities. Um, in identifying the signal slash cybersecurity priorities of work, not only for the Brigade S6 section, but also to be able to paint a common operational picture for the Brigade commander when it comes to um, reporting requ requirements when there are intrusions on the network. Um, what questions um, out in the audience do you have uh, regarding um, the current Brigade's uh, challenges um, that I see from my foxhole. So we'll come back to questions after each speaker gives their five minute spew and then uh, okay. circle back around and see. Okay, okay. Uh, so Major Mears, so as far as from the, the overall Brigade S6 and, and not getting into the technical aspect, um, you know, a lot of it, 
we have to look internal to our own formations as far as our, the accountability of our training and our maintenance starting off with. However, as far as uh, what industry can help us with, industry and institutional, uh, you know, we gotta, like Colonel Mulder was saying, it used, we used to have very few systems. Uh, now when you look in a brigade talk, you've got, uh, you know, a FATA, all these digital systems, just tons of them, and the Brigade S6's job is to integrate all of them. Uh, whether he understands all of the components or not, that's our job. So my, my old boss uh, coined the term, it's, it's the Brigade S6's problem, but it's not our fault. However, whenever something's not working, uh, whether it's an AFATAS box, a TAS box not talking, they always look to the S6 to fix it. So some of those things, uh, it's it's the interface, the, the users at the user level, because at those different systems, it's not a signal ear. Uh, while they are great Americans and they are smart, we've got some of the smartest soldiers in the force right now, but the, sometimes the systems are just a little too complex to just configure and get them talking together. So some of that interoperability, making that, more, making that a little more simple, and then also uh, with going to the decisive action rotations to where a brigade talk is jumping every 24 to 48 hours, uh, we need systems that are compact, mobile, redundant, and they can operate in extreme kind of extreme climates and environments because we're no longer in you know hard stand buildings staying for a year or two uh, in the same building and operating networks like that. So we need something that we can move around, something that's going to be reliable uh, to to shut down, turn on in a relatively quick amount of time. Because uh, if you you know if a unit needs to move for survivability, they can't wait a half hour for to shut down servers and all that good stuff. Uh, so, and then on the institutional side where we can use some help is really getting accountability of what's being taught. Is it being realistic? Uh, are we able to get to a point where a capstone is actually simulating or getting us to the point where we go out into the force and we're able to step in and actually contribute or are we doing a lot of on the job training once we get there? So if that's the case, then we need to cut this course short and uh, just go get a, cut some more reps on, on the job training. Uh, so I think we really need to look at that. I know that the schoolhouse is trying to, to make some adjustments, but uh, a lot of it comes down to accountability uh, in the institutional side of it, but also within the commander, you know, commanders and the, the VCT units, given that time to train and making sure that it's happening. So that's uh, where we're seeing some of the stuff in the Brigade S6. Thanks, Ricky. So uh, Major Don Sedeby with the uh, Cyber Protection Brigade. So the, uh, the main thrust of the point that I would like to, uh, that we've seen through our observations of supporting NTC rotations and OCONUS units is that the tools and capabilities do in fact exist at the VCT level to secure their portion of DOTA. However, the training on these tools is frequently, frequently delinquent. So looking at the different audiences that are here, so the, um, those tools and capabilities, so getting the training for those tools, so looking at from an industry perspective, are you building training with your tools uh, that is beyond just how to turn them on and to integrate them. So a tool is a tool to a certain extent. Um, turning it on is not sufficient uh, for what the defender needs to know. They need to be able to know how they should be thinking about employing it. That part of the, uh, the training is, is generally delinquent, that they may be able to get it on and operational, but actually functionally using it uh, can be problematic. So both from a unit perspective, you want to think through beyond just getting green lights and how to actually integrate it from an industry perspective, building uh, not only tools that are easy to use and require less time to be trained on, but that your training program is well flushed out as well. Um, I'll move on. Uh, Chief Flanagan from NTC. Uh, based off the observations I've made uh, from an EW perspective over the last year and a half, uh, I have two main areas that I believe industry and <coughs> Army can help signal officers be more successful. Um, First off, uh, I see soldiers having an extreme difficult time trying to identify and report interference. Um, if we could somehow make that process more automated and easy for soldiers to identify, uh, I think it would, it would help out a lot, much like the dagger. You know, you get notification that you are experiencing interference and it's, it's a lot easier. A lot of the times soldiers just think because these systems are so complex that, uh, that it's an operator so they're not recording the stuff up. Um, and then secondly, I think uh, Army systems are extremely easy to detect and disrupt. Um, I think diversifying our systems across the spectrum, uh, 
So someone mentioned in a panel yesterday, we have a little pizza slice within Spectrum where we're allowed to operate. Um, if, if we were able to go across you know, more bandwidth and use uh, more of the Spectrum, it would be a lot more difficult to detect these systems and actually interfere with them. Um, what we're seeing right now is a lot of commanders are actually ordering their formations to um, essentially have comms blackouts at decisive points throughout the rotation for fear of being detected uh, by the enemy and, and having fire missions called on them. Um, so yeah, those are basically the two, two areas I think we really need to focus on for the industry. Okay, my name is Bruce Adams. and. Uh, what you've heard, you've heard personnel, you've heard training, you've heard integration, you've heard some of the tools. Those are some of the areas that I've seen not just at, uh, at the BCTs or the CTCs, oh, excuse me, but also some of the warfighters. And when you look at different warfighters across CONUS as well as OCONUS, it's the being able to take some of the tools that we have out there and being able to integrate that into our operations. And it's also focused uh, also at the staff function, which was brought up as a, a challenge to get those integrated into how we integrate the capabilities into our formations and how we integrate that. And it starts with education. It starts with education and then a training piece. As far as industries, you already heard it once, as far as the training, is it simplifies so we can actually get it trained fast and we don't, we don't as I used to call it, drive-by fielding. We drop off a kit and very minimum training, and then the soldiers have to take this and put it into operation. So there's a OJTs, and sometimes we don't have OJT, especially when you look at a decisive action environment, we're not gonna have that. So we need to be able to get that into the hands of soldiers with the training uh, so they can understand it. Um, talked about also integrating some of the external capabilities, some of the tools that a, a cyber protect brigade can bring to the ta table. We gotta get better at doing that. Again, it ties back into the tools that they bring to the, to the table as well as the training. And how do I actually integrate them in, into uh, my operations? You heard home station training. Where industry can help out is sort of the modeling and simulations. How can we set up an environment where a EW or even a SEMA element within a BCT or a division or core can actually conduct training at home station. And again, it goes back to identifying, showing the effects of the threat, whether it's in the EW arena or uh, the SEMA arena. So showing that to commanders and staff leads back to the education piece so they can understand what's happening so they can respond and start integrating SEMA, EW, into uh, training, into, into their operations. So it, it's a uh, sort of a do loop here that we have to really get our hands around, our heads around, and industry can help us with part of that. So can process, you heard that, you heard individuals, but you also have to look at the leadership within there. In order to get the leadership more engaged with which they are now, but that's understanding and education. And we need to do better on that too. Thank you. So my first question to Colonel Norwood and Major Mears is, how is SEMA currently integrated in the BCT staffs and um, how, how does it work? How does uh, the BCT performs? Is it incorporated in the decision making process? And how are the S6s battalion and uh, brigade S6s affected? So uh, from what I've seen in, in, in as far as SEMA in, integrated into the mission analysis or MDMP program or just operations in general, uh, I mean, it, it's honestly not that much. It's, it's lacking. I think a lot of it goes back to understanding at the commander level what, what capabilities are out there. What, what can we really do with uh, like EW? What, what can we do with some of those assets? Um, I think some of that comes from, again, lack of knowledge at the command level, at the XO and, and S3 level, to where they can say, hey, what about this? We're not incorporating that. Because honestly, right now, I think with the status uh, across the board, we're still trying to get back to the, you know, getting our maneuver st stuff straight 
And so commanders are really focused on that, whether it's the maintenance, maintenance of their tanks and Bradleys, all that good stuff. So they're a lot more focused on that until they get to a, a comfortable level where we're consistent with that. Then we'll start to, to dig into more of the advanced uh, capabilities. But right now, and it's, it's an education thing. And sometimes too, it's where are your personnel? For EW folks, I see it probably more than anything. They end up being like the nat night battle captain or night battle NCO instead of actually being where they need to be uh, in the in those working groups and the plans to to get the those efforts and effects uh, in, into the maneuver fight. So, sir, is it safe to say that you lack of focus in some areas? Absolutely. I mean, it, there's just no focus or not no, but little focus. Uh, and I think it depends on the commander, what they're, what they've seen and what they've been, again, educated on what, what they've seen and, and everything. So uh, it's just, they're not focused on that. The staffs, some of those, the people involved, the S6s, uh, the EWOs, uh, and, and all those guys are trying to get some of that information in there. But again, if it's not the priority uh, or, or something that they're thinking about or understand what effects they can really get out of it and actually make an impact, it kind of gets pushed to the side because the tempo is moving so fast that, that we, we aren't able to focus on that. Yeah, and I, I think uh, a lot of that actually leads up. It's personality driven as well. So if you have an aggressive EWO that has those staff relationships prior to coming out and he's in good with his six and he's in good with his two um, and he's developed those relationships, uh, they're more willing to accept his, his input during the MVMP process and it'll make that unit a lot more successful. So uh, not all units are horrible with it, um, but it, I really feel like it's personality driven, so. I, I wanna be the honest broker here. Um, for the Army, I mean, everybody wearing a green suit knows that SEMA and the idea of, of cyber and EW integration is a new concept for us. We just published the SEMA doctrine in April of last year. Um, the the updates that bring SEMA cells, SEMA sections into the BCTs and the divisions um, hasn't yet been approved, I don't believe. It's still in staffing. So I don't want to say we're putting the cart before the horse, but we're demanding a lot of our units without giving them yet the, the uh, resources to accomplish the mission. We don't have a lot of EW tools out there. Uh, we don't have a lot of cyber tools out there. We've got some cybersecurity tools, uh, we're building it as we go, um, but it'll take another year or so before we really have uh, something that we can collect against and build the Army's library of lessons learned and, and uh, TTPs and how to do it right. So the good news is we're at the ground level. We can make it whatever we want. So provide us your feedback, provide us your thoughts, your ideas on how can the Army do these things what are we? What gaps do we have that we haven't recognized yet? And Colonel Colonel Malter is spot on because SEMA's new. If you look across the, the brigades, uh, there's no there's no uh, equipment on the MTO for any of the units out there. The first uh, taste of the units actually using tools are when they come to the CTCs. Um, so that 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 shows a gap from home station to when they go to the CTCs or at, or at NTC in particular. It's the first time they're using the equipment. Major Mears. So when the S6s participate in MVMP maneuver operation, do they understand the maneuver operation? When they form the signal plan, does it fairly conform to what the commander wants in support of the maneuver? At, at, I would say at the brigade level, yeah. I think for the most part, the brigade S6s do pretty well with getting integrated in, into the MDMP and understanding the overall. But when you get to the battalion level, I think that's where we see a little more struggle because A, that they get marginalized and pushed off to the side and not included in the plan. The planners just go ahead and they, they say, hey, we're gonna go there and, and you know, then they get to the spot and they can't talk and then they yell at the S6 for it. So I think at the brigade level, we're doing okay. And I, I, I see a more aggressive or assertive S6s, they're included in the team, but it's at the battalion level where it's a little more struggle. You get uh, some some really good, and then some that just get pushed off to the side and are, are not part of it. Yeah, so um, 
Uh, Mr. Adams, from the call perspective, uh, for more an overview, uh, can you um, uh, uh, give us uh, some ideas about this? You bring up a good point, and, and that goes back into the, the staff function piece and as far as building relationship within, within that as you're trying to identify uh, some of your uh, information requirements, and, and you, you've got to work with the two. Uh, as well as the six to identify that and let the uh, uh, commander and staff know. From a SEMA perspective, if you integrate with, uh, if at the working groups, when you get to the other staff elements in engaged, you're able to identify some of the requirements that they have, but you're also able to relay what, what you need uh, from a SEMA perspective or EW perspective as well. Uh, I've seen that in working groups, even at, uh, at some BCTs, but at some divisions that worked well, and in some uh, working groups, they didn't have the right personnel in there. So you, you, you have some gaps in there. So now you got to make some assumptions, and uh, those assumptions sometimes takes time. And when you're in this type of environment, a decisive action environment, you don't have that time. Commander expects that to get those uh, 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 his requirements done as quickly as possible, and that's another piece of this too is trying to educate commanders and staff on what their information requirements are so they can relay that within the SEMA arena as well as the EW. We've got to get better at doing that as well. Yes, I have another question to Mitchell ZDV. Um, uh, so recently you wrote a guide for cybersecurity for BCT or whichever level. So when you uh, support uh, BCT, um, do you think the PCT uh, is, is currently uh, uh, well prepared uh, to support you when you arrive? Yeah, so, uh, so as far as when uh, my team goes to integrate with a, a BCT, um, much like any other integrative element, it's about interpersonal relationships. So um, it is fundamentally, um, I cannot come with my team and wave a magic wand and the network is secure. Um, nothing will remove the S6's ownership of the network, and, and that is the context of which I work in. We are an enabling asset for that S6 to secure their network. We can bring a whole bunch of techniques and capabilities and extra manpower. Um, so operating in the context of I am there to facilitate the S6's security of the network so they can facilitate <laughs> their commander's uh, mission command. So that's the real approach there. So um, as long as that um, understanding is achieved at the initial uh, onset there, then it's a, it's a very good working relationship. How much we we're able to do is entirely dependent on how much time we have, uh, generally. Uh, the more time we have with the, netic, uh, the network, uh, where it is not in use by the warfighter, so COMEXs are generally the best time where we get the most work. We can work around FTXs. Um, the two main tasks we look to accomplish when we're supporting BCTs, uh, I phrase as fortify and monitor. They're not doctrine quite yet. Uh, got some things into Colonel Packer, but uh, fortify is just implementing configuration changes to make their uh, network secure uh, configuration and policy changes. And then monitoring is setting up a series of sensors to look at what's going on in their network. Um, the more time that I have beforehand, I can do more fortifying. When operations are ongoing, uh, we're almost exclusively monitoring and doing small configuration changes. And when I say we're doing configuration changes, we're recommending to the S6, and they are the ones that implement them. Thank you. Uh, for the audience, when you uh, like to ask questions or are open to ask, raise your hands. Uh, um, uh, Lieutenant Köber. Packer, you are the second. First, uh, Mr. Crane. Okay, so go ahead. <laughs> So, so the um, so the most critical gaps for the 25 deltas and the 255 Sierras 
are uh, one manning, so your typical BCT is supposed to have one 255 Sierra and three 25 Deltas. Uh, I've only been to one BCT where I've actually seen an organic 255 Sierra, uh, normally with one to two Deltas. Uh, and a lot of times uh, they may be used for ComSec, they may be used for whatever. Um, so the reality at the BCT is that um, you're gonna do whatever prevents the commander from punching you in the face, um, to put it bluntly. Um, a lot of times uh, that will involve getting the network available. That's the number one thing that the commander cares about. As long as he can talk, he is happy. Uh, but allocating and shielding those personnel with, okay, hey, I want you to focus on these specific security tasks and be able to do it on more than, okay, hey, you've got an hour to look at your scene basis uh, is something that will inhibit the level of security that they're able to provide. Uh, and that's not saying that, hey, sometimes that 255, that 25 Delta and that 255 Sierra, the most important thing may be to get the network up, uh, but there is a cost to the level of security they're able to provide the BCT. So, so the next question for me to uh, Chief Lenigan is uh, what, uh, what is the best practices? How is el electronic warfare regarding to Zima um, integrated in, uh, in a BCT uh, decision-making process? Uh, I'm not sure. So a more specificity, please? Or? Um, so, so when you, are, when you see the um, uh, MDMP in a, in a BCT, and what is uh, the best practices you uh, see at NTC? How is uh, electronic warfare integrated uh, in this uh, in the process? So yeah, again, uh, it's it's really personality based. Um, you have to have an aggressive EW team. Uh, they need to be again all the staff sections. We, we generally don't have our own SEMA working group, so it's on the it's on the uh, EWO to get out to all the targeting working groups and you know, every opportunity he gets to, to sprinkle SEMA uh, throughout the MDMP process is, is really the key. So, um, that's, that's it in a nutshell. There, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of different um, techniques I've seen, uh, different, different ways people get it done, but it really comes down to, to personality. So, yeah, so that's a current situation meet your expectations uh, about integrating EW so or SEMA? It, it's hit or miss, it's 50-50. Sometimes you get um, people that are really excited about SEMA and, and getting it in there. Um, and then, you know, other times you either don't, you don't have the full staffing or, um, you know, they're busy, like, like what you gentlemen mentioned, busy doing schools or night battle captain or, so again, it, it varies from unit to unit. So. Thank you. Oh, so, all right, I'll take it. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, Chief Stewart, um, more of a um, question for the room. How many uh, uh, industry partners or vendors are in the room right now? Could you raise your hand? I don't mean to put you on the spot. Okay. So you all are paying attention to all these uh, smart uh, panel members up there, and they're all speaking the right thing. So the biggest thing for and I, I'm, I'm an electronic warfare technician, so I, I can only really speak to electronic warfare. I can speak to some, uh, I guess, uh, SEMA stuff, so I've uh, been in SEMA sales in the future. But the biggest thing for an electronic warfare person is that home station training. I know they said it uh, uh, multiple times. So you're not going to have a really, um, I guess you said, well-qualified or trained electronic warfare person. Let's say he's going through that training while he's at home station. So going to NTC or JRTC and actually getting to do your job there, isn't going to make you a very good uh, electronic warfare technician, electronic warfare officer, electronic warfare NCO. But the biggest, I would say, issue that we're having right now is the ability to do home station training. So as a, as a, as industry or your or your vendors, that is that is a problem that we're facing. And although the CCOE and 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 people are trying to solve that problem for us right now, it would help if if industry also looked at that problem. I don't know the answer to it. Like I said, I'm the technician on the side trying to do the, uh, trying to, tr to, to receive the training. But if you can help us out with that home station training so that individual can go through repetitions before he even hits NTC 
so he's he's well trained before going out there. Then the problems that uh, that uh, uh, Chief Flanagan is, was was bringing up, where you actually have to depend on that person's personality, is that aggressive guy who's going to uh, inject himself in there because he hasn't necessarily been doing it prior to getting there. We we may not uh, run into those problems in the future. So that's that's pretty much all I have to say. Right there. Yes, sir. For our industry partners. Um, it's really too bad there aren't more of you out there uh, in the audience today. Hopefully they're all getting what they need throughout the conference, but um, we're very interested in helping you understand what it is that we need or, or, or putting you in the position to help us understand uh, what gaps we have that we can't figure out. Um, so <clears throat> I'll go out on a limb, uh, contracting be damned or, or the acquisition world. Uh, if you need an answer to something, if, even if you just want to see how the Army does it, contact us. We'll get you in touch with uh, an opportunity to, to observe an exercise, a training event. Uh, we might not get out to the NTC, but we have things like Cyber Quest, Cyber Blitz, uh, lots of different exercises where we have troops trying to do these things that you'd be more than welcome to, to come out and and either bring your wares through the process or just come out and see how the Army functions so then you can build better tools to meet our requirements that we don't even know we have yet. Uh, that's the whole beauty of industry is to, to show us new things, emerging technologies that will make life easier for our soldiers. So contact us. We'll show you how you do that here shortly. Uh, but I don't mind uh, dropping everything to get people linked up to get the right folks talking to make things better for soldiers. Go ahead.
Thank you. Who from the panel wants to give an answer or comment uh, with this? So I'm with you 100%. Um, the uh, CPCs aren't the be all end all. Uh, growing up as a young soldier back in the 20s, we never, uh, I never went to the NTC. I didn't go to the NTC until I became an observer controller. Um, so, you know, if we uh, go into a conflict tomorrow, chances are the enemy isn't going to ask, have you been to a CTC rotation? If not, we'll give you 180 days to get trained up. So we've got to figure out how to do this at home station. And uh, I'm with you on simulations. They do have their, their place, um, especially in our world. Uh, you know, if our defending or cyber defenders who don't normally operate on the network when they're in garrison have a tool that they can simulate a network and, and practice going against uh, simulated attacks, it's better than what they have today. Uh, same thing with the EW guys or the signal guys. Um, every time I deployed, I would take a server full of CBTs so everybody in the division could reach into it and uh, continue training while they're sitting watching lights for month after month. Uh, so we want to take advantage of the opportunities that are out there. A lot of times we just don't know what, what those opportunities are. So knock on some doors, beat on some doors, uh, crawl through the fence uh, on North Fort Gordon, whatever it takes to get in to, to talk to us and let us know what capabilities exist. Sir. I'm interested in knowing uh, to what degree I could penetration test the different helicopters and, and, and aircraft that fly over the southeastern coast where I habituate a lot of time and I worry frequently when I see helicopters rolling out and they're off post and they're out of Hunter and I wonder if they think they're just flying over families' houses and I, is, is there a bug bounty or is there a bug reporting program where a civilian or a researcher like me could invest the money I wanted to invest to so DOD has done some bug bounty efforts in the last uh, couple of years. I've, I don't know if there's any that are open right now. Um, potentially getting working uh, with the CPV, help me out here if I'm full of crap, yeah. but uh, they may be able to help link you up with how, uh, how to do some of that. Uh, it's their mission, one of the big missions of the CPV and the CPTs, the Cyber Protection Brigade and the Cyber Protection Teams is to harden uh, in the cyberspace our our major weapon systems, so slinging it over. Yep, so thank you, sir, for the uh, assist there. So um, so at the large army level, there is no program that I know exists where to get industry involved in looking at some of these systems. Uh, I know that there was a uh, NDA 1647 a uh, number of years ago where Congress mandated the uh, DOD to look at um, various pieces of um, their infrastructure and do an assessment as to what the vulnerabilities are out there. There, there are um, people that are that are doing those, but I don't know to what degree they're bringing in external organizations. It sounds like uh, a fantastic um, opportunity potentially, but uh, slightly above my pay grade to uh, to authorize. Uh, it's, a, it's a joke, but um, the uh, um, but there is no uh, there's no mechanism to my knowledge to do that. But that sounds like something that we should definitely explore. And you can also reach out to Army Cyber, our cyber headquarters, and uh, talk to them. Sir. come through and they've they've narrowed that delta from what the CPB augmentation actually has to do you know the limit the amount of work that they actually have to go into fortify a monitor what have those brigade sixes done well to harden their network before they even get that augmentation uh, I mean that's 
That's a good question. I mean, it varies from unit to unit. Um, and I think a lot of it comes from the experience of the warrant officers that they have on hand. Uh, Cause sometimes we see units coming in and they're, they are not very well postured when they, when they arrive. So there's a lot of work that they've got to do that, that my, uh, my OCs uh, that are, my warrant officers work with them to get them there. Uh, and I know that Colonel Millwood probably also works with them as well. Um, so. So in a simple term, um, the information assurance regulation AR 25-2, a lot of the, a lot of the big cyber hygiene 101 for any BCT, which is the, the biggest uh, Achilles heel, is basic default passwords. Small things such as that. I know it, I know you're sitting there like, oh wow, but I mean it covers it, 101, that is probably the, the biggest thing that um, BCT struggle with and then on top of that, I know DISA provides uh, hardening through the DISA website. The biggest thing is applying some of those uh, within the network uh, group policy objects and just basic um, referencing the security technical information guides. They just, they just don't spend enough time um, implementing those security policies. Some units have time and they, and they do it better than others, but the, the bottom line, and, I, and I, I'm big on people, process, and technology, the biggest thing in um, the information assurance, right, is the information assurance workforce. Every unit down to uh, platoon and platoon and above, they, they have, you have to have the IA workforce to have a good security program because all it takes is one person to open up a hole in the network. And, and, and that's really what, that's the dialect that the Brigade S6 has to have um, with the workforce when it includes all the battalion S6s. And then there has to be some division involvement. Um, I, I've seen a lot of it when I was in 2ID, when I worked for division headquarters. The division, we would go down and inspect all the brigades. And then we'd even go down to the companies and we saw some of the, some of the biggest issues were the basic stuff, getting back to the basics. And some of it comes back to accountability too. Again, I, I hit that earlier. Like we've had units to come through, they had a division inspection come down and say, hey, you need to fix this. And then it, one of the units actually, one of those inspectors from division had to augment the brigade that came. So she was working on the same server. She just said, hey, you needed to do this. It wasn't done by the time she got there. So she ended up having to do it. So they, they weren't coming behind saying, okay, you had 30 days to get this done. And nobody came down and said, you didn't do this. So some of that accountability of just doing the basic updates and, and other initial hardening stuff that you're supposed to do, we're just not checking up on it because we've got too many other things going on possibly. So, and to kind of caveat on that, so if, if I can encapsulate a little bit, it comes down to prioritization and coming up with a realistic plan. Um, anybody can go and come up with a laundry list of, yep, these are all the things we need to fix. Okay, which ones are the most realistic that I have the time for and which ones are, the, are gonna have the biggest effect on my network? So having that assessment and then having the expertise to do that in a timely manner and leveraging uh, expertise from your division and core uh, if, if, uh, if able. So a lot of times um, at the BCTs, you may get a brand new W1 uh, a lot of times and it's, you know, individuals may vary. If you are aware that you're lacking in some expertise, pulling in that expertise from your division core, that's why, that's why they're there. So um, prioritization and coming up with a realistic um, assessment of what you can do with the time you have available. And w once again, you gotta have senior leader um, buy-in. Um, that was directed by the division commander at the time was uh, General Cardone. Um, so once again, if the division commander priorities of work pushes it down top down, then you'll see, you'll definitely see some, uh, some movement. But once again, time, we all don't have time, it's personnel that we don't have enough of. That's where we need industry's help to develop tools that make these things easier. So, you know, one of the Army regulations, uh, I'm not a doctrine or Army regulation kind of guy, but um, <laughs> just because I am the chief of doctrine. Um, <laughs> so we're supposed to, our, our system admins are supposed to look at these logs on a 24-hour basis to scan the logs and, and uh, check for concerns but we get gigabytes of log data every day from all the stuff we have. 
Uh, it's just impossible. I can't hire enough people to do that. So how do I aggregate these things? Um, I don't need separate tools. I need tools that are integrated. So I have, I'm not going to uh, buy a tool and then have to buy three more people to operate it. I need it to be integrated into what I already have uh, so I can do it with the workforce I have. Um, patching. I mean, patching is just, it's just a nightmare. Uh, down at Southcom, on a daily basis, I would be behind about 30,000 patches every day. And Patch Tuesday would come up, and that number would jump to 150,000. My team would, would work tirelessly on it for days. Uh, and by about next, the following Monday, we'd back, be back down to the 30,000, uh, waiting for the next Patch Tuesday. And I would, I would bring them in, and I'd like, come on, guys. How do we break this plateau? How do we get below 30,000? And we, I mean, we, we analyzed the death, and we just were unable to do it. A couple times we got down to 14, but, but I mean, it's a, it's a Herculean effort. And then when you talk about tactical forces who might lock their machines up in a Connex for 45 days or more, when do they get patched? And how do you keep up? We need, we need some more common sense on how to make these things easier. And I talked about the whole thing of reviewing the cybersecurity logs and not having enough people that understand how to do it, to do it consistently and constantly uh, so things get through. You might not catch that there's a problem for 24 hours. Well, by then it's too late. Things have already happened. So I would like to ask the other panel members in which areas do you think can industry support? So we heard uh, the patching, the updating for the system. In uh, what other areas do you think can uh, industry help us to be successful? I think I, I know I've read it through uh, Gardner, but I don't know if there's like self-healing technologies out there, artificial intelligence. Um, as systems are offline for 45 days, is there something you can apply to that system? to where it's uh, doing some uh, type of patch updates disconnected from the network. I know there's studies on the different hard drives and chipsets, but I don't know if industry has something out there that would reduce the uh, overhead costs for uh, soldiers to be able to put those systems online to get those needed updates. So uh, the brigade struggle even with the re-imaging process, the time, and it's still overhead. Um, sometimes they, when they when they come through, they're still trying to re-image right before they um, head out the mission. Well, and the, the problem is we use the Army Gold Standard for the image, and uh, and then we patch off that. So you can create a new image uh, every 30 days with all the latest patches on it, but I mean, it takes time to do that because you've got to run that new image through all the testing against all the systems for the unique software applications that we have, the, the unique ones that units build, and everything else to make sure everybody's tool that's out there works. Um, and when you're looking at a thousand man headquarters, each one of them has three computers, there's you know a ton of switches and everything else, re-imaging is okay, but, but it's, not, it's nothing easy to do. I mean, when we went to uh, Windows 10, I mean, it, it took weeks to get a division or a, a uh, COCOM headquarters through the process to get all the machines switched over and then weeks and weeks and weeks to fix all the problems that we didn't catch when we did the, the testing. Uh, so that is a solution and we do do that uh, on a number of occasions, but if it's, 500 computers and you got four privates and a couple NCOs doing it, it takes time. And we try to maintain image control so we don't just give it to everybody, here, re-image your computer. No, they've got to turn their computer in somewhere uh, to get it re-imaged. Sir. Yeah, 
I mean, part of my 30,000 were uh, IP phones and, uh, and uh, the, what's the secure phone we use now? The, somebody help me out, the secure IP telephone that sits on desks. Vipers. They were a big problem. And how do you patch those? <coughs> Some things you just can't push the patch over the network. It's got to take touch labor. So, Mitchell Mears, do you have some ideas? How our industry can support, or in which areas industry can support? Uh, I mean, at, again, I think we've kind of hit it. My biggest thing is just making it more familiar, like interfaces more familiar for soldiers that may not be able to get the training, uh, you know, hours and hours to become experts, but at least if they had uh, an interface that was that was familiar, something they've already used, uh, you know, name your kind of device that, that it's, it's kind of common, but at least they have a starting off point instead of having to learn the, the system all over again, especially then you do an update on the same system and it's all changed up again, so now they have to relearn a lot of stuff again. So. Uh, it's, it's all about simplicity, especially for those uh, systems that, again, I give our, our signal ears a little more credit and I also hold them to a higher standard as far as being more technically competent to do some of that. But when you have the operators out there that are focused on, this is what I needed to do, and, and I, I don't have necessarily all the time to learn how to configure every little widget on it, uh, we need to kind of make that a little more simple so we can get in the game faster make it easier for our 16 because you're usually the ones that they'll come to to help troubleshoot it. And again, they're having to learn that system enough to to try to help them out. And that's, that's kind of where I see industry can kind of help is making things simpler and, and uh, more mobile for our teams. And I don't know if we have any radio people out there. Um, for the last 15 years, we've pretty much given up on EW. I mean, we used to, uh, back in the, again, back in the 20s, we used to put uh, all of our radio vans on top of the hill and then we'd cable or use a very discreet line of sight system to shoot down to the top, down at the bottom of the hill. So if uh, the radio vans were detected, they were blown up, not the entire command staff. Um, we've, we've stopped doing that because of the environment that we've been fighting in for the last 15 years. So we've got to get back doing that on the TTP side of the house, you know, separating things more. Um, but I don't think the radio technology has kept up with the threat. What do we, we need radios, uh, especially wideband radios that, are, that can survive jamming, that uh, can be less detectable in the, in the spectrum world um, in order to continue the mission. Um, I just don't think that, that uh, we are looking as far out and at the right, right threat um, that we have today. Uh, I keep telling everybody that you know, we had MSC for 20 years. We started fielding in 1984, and about 2004 we started fielding what became the first version of WinT, the JNN, and CPNs. It's 15 years old now. What are we looking at for next? Are we prepared for that? oh crap moment where we say what we got in working, it's time to go to the next generation. What is it? I don't know who's looking at that or where we are. And I will say on top of that, sir, absolutely with the, uh, the, the radio piece, uh, we, we talk a lot about our digital systems and capabilities, especially at the brigade level uh, and higher, but when it comes to battalions, even though they need to have their upper TI systems up so that they can receive orders and and pass communication between uh, different staff or warfighting functions. But commanders are going to default to that, that lower TI, that FM. Uh, I would even say HF, but a lot of them don't even go to that. It's, it's a lot of FM. So if we're not focusing on that and trying to improve and, and, and do those things that Colonel Moulter talked about, uh, we're, we're opening ourselves up for a lot of pain uh, if we don't make some improvements in there too. So there's still a lot of emphasis on FM and those types of systems, even though you know we've got all this great technology and capabilities out there, but commanders, when it comes down to fighting and moving across the battlefield, it's it's push to talk, uh, get the message across, and keep rolling. So that's that's kind of the name of the game right now. So we got to also include that. I think we get away from talking about those systems a lot. 
And we've, we've bought a ton of radios. We continue to buy a ton of radios, even in the single channel side of the house. But you know, back in the 80s, we made a huge jump from the old PRC 77 and that family radios to Singars because it brought us frequency hopping and it was, you know, no one's ever gonna be able to find us in the spectrum. Well, things have changed. So what's that next big leap in radio technology that we're not doing or, or we're not considering? Mr. Adams, uh, probably you have seen uh, from a uh, call perspective in, uh, in other COE's uh, solutions. Do you see something, uh, how, how can uh, industry support uh, the army? Do you see areas or solutions we can adapt uh, at, at the Cyber Center of uh, Excellence? I, I'll just recap on some of the uh, areas, the tools that was brought up. I'll reiterate our home station training, an environment where we can test and, and exercise units in their SOPs and battle drills and to be able to refine that there. Those are tools that, that the, the unit, the force needs to be able to get their skill set up to a point where when they get to a, an, an NTC or a CTC rotation, they're not training, they're, they're actually executing and being able to manage it as well as deployment. Uh, another area that might help out or look at is some of the planning tools that would help us be able to, uh, and it could fall in with AI, but be able to uh, help us identify or at least respond to some of the threat capabilities that are out there. Being able to do some predictive analysis so we can actually come up with some of their methods or uh, identify vulnerabilities or opportunities within, within that environment to respond or at least focus our capabilities on when we go into a, uh, a AOR or a threat AOR. Some of those type of things will help with the planning process as well. Um, home station training, making the tools that we do have, that you do produce, easier to use for the soldiers. Uh, that's all I have right, right now. Thank you very much. Our time is almost over. Um, I would like to thank the panel members for the insights you gave us. I would like to thank uh, the audience for, for coming. And the last uh, event we do, we uh, do the tour. I would like to hand over to Mr. San Miguel. He organized the tour for the flex. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, so the last piece of this is if you did not get a ticket, uh, and that is for the, we only got very few tickets in here. Uh, if you do not have a ticket and you want one, raise your hand, we'll get one to you. So this is for the semaphore flags that are sitting up here. Uh, so I don't, here, flip it over, pull, that's okay. Flip it over, pull out a ticket, and uh, I'll, I'll call out the number, see what we got. Just get one. There you go. All right, first one for us, 227516. Right there? All right, give them a round of, round of applause. Congratulations. 227516, the first one. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. That concludes uh, our presentation, and have a great day.